Professor Su Young Kes, University Standard Philosophy Course. Hi, everyone. Today is our third lesson. Will we learn more about ancient Greece? No. Today's theme is Eastern philosophy. In the first place, philosophy has neither Western nor Eastern, as well as ancient nor modern. For the first Eastern philosopher, it is an old story. An idea that gradually crystallized by many people. It probably began with the Chinese civilization around the 17th century BC. What is it? It is Tao, meaning a way. However, it is not a straight one way from cause to result, but a band line on which everything rotates. Is it a kind of god? Every Eastern dynasty did not last long, so no gods in the Eastern were absolute. Tao is like Moira of the Western, but it is more dynamic and changes dynasties frequently. It is very suitable to call Aka, isn't it? However, is it different from Aeon or existing in Western philosophy? Aeon is one and whole. Due to that, it rules the world ultimately with static harmony. Thus, the West fell into a poria of philosophy and Christianity. What is a poria? No way. In other words, dead end. Everything has to go straight to the respective destinies already determined. And anyone never changes it, and never gets out of it. It is determinism, right? Their failure is that they had painted the world completely black. Here, look at these pictures. Westerners can't get enough unless they have drawn clouds even in the sky. On the other hand, Easterners dare to leave a blank space. As their dynasties never could rule all the continent, they know there is always something they do not know in the margin. Now, do you know this? Yeah. I've seen it before, but what is it? It is the symbol of the Eastern worldview, where, following the tail of another, two fishes are rotating. Oh, my stupid black and white cats are often spinning around like this. Not only of black, but with white, the world is made up. The ancient Chinese established the first unified dynasty in the 17th century BC. Through experience. They knew the ten-year cycle, where the year with mild weather and the year with harsh one repeat on. In addition, by observation, they found the sun looked quite different depending on each year. So they thought that there are ten different suns, and they in turn make different year weathers. From here, they assumed a cycle of discrete ten numbers called ten gans or heavens. They might have discovered sunspots. They probably thought that suns are like administration officials who have each year in charge. They also noticed that sometimes the sun of the year is influential strongly, but other times less, and they discovered it relates to the position of Jupiter. Actually, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, so it shifts even the sun from the center and changes its activities. Based on this fact, they considered a cycle of continuous strength, which they expressed in twelve phases of plants, from seed to withering. They are named twelve Gs or basements. I have first heard the sun does not stay always at the center of the solar system. On the other hand, day and night suggest the dualistic cycle of yin and yang, which you see in the Taiji diagram. They applied it not only to light or dark, but also to everything, presence or absence, and move or stop, and so on. However, they didn't have dualism of right and wrong, like Westerners. Yin and yang are good for both when they circulate well. For the rotation. It is preferable that the rising yang is at the bottom and the descending yin is at the top. If it is the other way around, yin and yang separate and the world becomes stagnant. It is not dualism, but rather a sort of monism, right? In addition, in the age of political confusion of the 8th century BC, they thought of a mixture of the five natures: cheese, wood, fire, mud, metal, and water. According to this theory, wood grows fire, fire grows mud, mud grows metal. Metal grows water, and water grows wood, and this positive circulating relation is called mutual growing. Vice versa, wood hinders mud, mud hinders water, water hinders fire, fire hinders metal, and metal hinders wood, and this negative one is called mutual hindering. In the end, although we may say simply Tao is circulation, it includes different ones: the ten gans of order, the twelve Gs of strength, the yin yang of alternation, and the five Gs of mixture, doesn't it? As mentioned, the 8th century BC 
when the five G's was invented, was a time of confusion, so politicians made their scholars, develop the fortune-telling theory, to analyze and improve their situations. When we can see the future, we want to rely on fortune-telling. In their worldview, there is heaven above them and earth below them. So by fortune-telling with bamboo sticks etc., they stacked three yin-yangs, and made eight trigrams, sky, ground, wind, valley, thunder, mountain, fire, and water. The center of any of them, is the client, and the teller checks, the correspondence between the upper and the lower. If the upper is yin and the lower is yang, both are harmonious and it goes well, but if opposite, it does not. That's easy to understand. Moreover, to examine the relationship between oneself and opponent, ruler and people, now and then, etc., they stacked the trigrams twice, and made 64 hexagrams. Also in this case, important is the correspondence between the center of the lower trigram and the one of the upper trigram. The hexagrams also express chronological order. However, it goes from the bottom to the top. So, the lowest bar means preparing, the next is now, the third is action, the fourth is the response, the fifth is the result, and the top is the last conclusion. We can consider the hexagrams, also as situations in a country, each bar represents the following position from the bottom to the top, farmers, soldiers, officials, ministers, a king, and a wise. It is interesting that the top is not a king but a wise. I wonder if it was the fortune teller itself. Actually, many fortune tellers appeared, and tried to be adopted by kings and nobilities as advisors. Confucius about 500 BC, was also one of such consultants who learned yin yang logi. But if the fate is decided, what could they advise? Yin and yang are young or old, so if they are old, they will eventually reverse themselves, and change the whole of the situation. Even if they are not, by changing the bar in question, the fortune teller could improve the situation. It might be for example, replacing the crappy minister with someone else. In the 5th century BC, politics became more chaotic. Until then, war was only once a year, during the agricultural off-season, but now, they had to fight any time with all sides. Along with this, fortune-telling also became more complex. First of all, they incorporated into yin-yang, other cycles, 10 gans, 12 gs, and 5 gs. It was not so hard. They divided each qi, into yin and yang, so they applied them to 10 gans, and evaluated their strength by 12 gs. However, the problem was the newly introduced 4 seasons and 4 directions. Suddenly, the numbers don't add up. Therefore, some assigned, wood, fire, metal, and water of 5 gs, to the east, the south, the west, and the north, or spring, summer, fall, and winter, and considered rest mud as the center, or the unstable transitions but others proposed different ways, so the fortune-telling theories became also chaotic. Disappointed with political confusions, Tao researchers left, and divided into three groups, Tao Shi, Fang Shi, and Taoist. How were they different? Tao Shis were pragmatic questers of the Tao. They went into deep mountains, trained themselves, and tried to be one with the Tao. Oh, they were hermits, one day? But they could truly fly in the sky and walk on the pond? Maybe, as we today have gliders and hydrofoils. They believed, nature is full of free energy, but it has been offset, by its own confusion. Just if we could sort it out, we could use the power, so they thought. Actually for example, by arranging confused light with a ruby cylinder, we can take out of it, a powerful laser. Oh, it should be the force, I know it in movies. However, they could not so easily find a way, to take out of nature power. Therefore, they fell into nature magic, and worshipped the Tao in rituals. Yeah, I saw it also in cheap horror movies. On the other hand, Fang Shis went down to markets. They pretended to be fine Tao Shis, who had acquired supernatural powers, performed dubious fortune telling, and sold people, useless fetishes and medicines, at high prices. However, some of them were the true pioneers of chemistry. Oh, the elixir of immortality, etc., were they? But I cannot distinguish between Tao Shi and Feng Shi. Yeah, anyway, they might be both fishy. However, in contrast, influenced by Confucianism, the third group of Taoists deepened their ideas academically in their studies. They hated not only vulgar Feng Shis but also unworldly Tao Shis. Because according to them, Tao is not so special, but the natural common law we can find wherever and whenever. Is it the same as Moya? No. 
They rejected fortune telling, even yin yang loji. Tao is just a way, without difference of yin or yang, well or ill, even wise or people. In addition, as just a way, Tao forces nothing, so anyone may be able to go out of it, and to twist things as one likes. Then, any fortune telling won't work. Though, they believed, everything will eventually turn back to its own root, the Tao. So, it is smart, just to follow the Tao, with no intervention. They expressed the motto, with the word, Wu Wei Ji Ran, namely, without care, let all be. They summarized their ideas, under the name of the legendary philosopher Lao Zi, older than Confucius. Easterners are all weak against authority, and Thinkoda is greater. By the way, the Confucian school was founded, around 500 BC, by Confucius, to train bureaucrats, by teaching courtesy, but it had lost popularity, in the political confusion. However, in the 4th century BC, Mencius appeared in the school, and by focusing on inner humanity, Ren, he appealed to youths again. Though hence they thought, they never should abandon their ethics, even for service. For this reason, in those turbulent times, some of them dared not to serve in any house. They were called, Yinshis. Did they also go into the deep mountains, like hermits? No, they just rejected service as officials. Keeping high morality, living in small towns, they worked with people, even if they were poor. Zhuangzi around 300 BC, was also one of such Yinshi of Confucianism. Influenced by Taoists, he deepened Mencius' idea of Ren, and recognized it, as an inner human Tao. He insisted that, we should do everything positively, as following inner humanity, Ren. So, although he approved Taoists' Jiran or the self-generating power of nature, he denied their Wu Wei or human inaction. Simultaneously, while the Confucians despised the common people, he believed, even a littlest one, has been given its proper mission, for the smooth rotation of Tao, so he expressed that, as, Wan Wu Chi Tong, everything is equally same. And, although he talked much, he valued practice more than words. Was Juinji, a Confucian? I hear, he was along with Lao Zi, a representative Taoist. Those who compiled Zhuangzi's sayings and deeds, were Taoists, so they added a lot of their own ideas, under his name. Oh, that is the same, as when they forged Lao Zi. Anyway, thus Taoism was established, under the names of Lao Zi and Zhuangzi. And when Buddhism was introduced, they modified it, to their own Zen philosophy. Furthermore, later, vice versa, by incorporating Taoism, Neo-Confucianism swept across the East, as the absolute political philosophy. The power of Taoism, is amazing. Ugh, getting a lot into my brain, makes my stomach empty. I wonder if it is also Yin Yang of Tao.